Ephesians chapter 1. We're at verse 15 now, but let's remember a little bit what we covered last week, shall we? Last week we described believers as being the body of Christ. We describe believers as the chosen people. God chose believers. He picked those who believe the gospel. He picked those people to be his people, to adopt us, to save us. And he picks us to sanctify us on this earth, to use us on this earth for his honor and glory. You are chosen. I don't mean that in any sort of Hollywood terms or lukewarm terms like other churches talk about, some feel-good idea. You are chosen. It's both a wonderful thing, it's also a responsibility. You're a soldier of Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. At this church, we strive to keep that at the forefront of our minds, how God chose us and he called us for his honor and glory. Today, as we consider how wonderful it is to be chosen, I, I ask you this, I wish you would. Make this like, a, like a, a concerted effort in your heart. I want you to look at a person next to you, you don't have to look at them physically, but think about a person next to you who also is chosen, who's a born again believer. Maybe they believed years ago, maybe they believed yesterday, but I want us to consider the believers around us today. For if they are bought by the blood of Christ, they are chosen as well. And I want to use this text here with Paul the Apostle to look at how did Paul view the rest of the body of Christ? How did he view the Christians around him? What was his thought? I'll tell you one thing that's very different than Paul and most people is that his thought was on other people. You see that in his writings. God has in his mind this very focus on other people, how they are growing, how Paul wants them to grow, how Paul wants them to succeed in service of God Almighty. This thought of thinking about others. Please look, please look at verse 15 and we'll get started. Paul writes, inspired by God, he says, Wherefore I also... After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints. I want you to note here, all Paul says is after I heard about it. Over here at the church of Ephesus, Paul hears about these people, their faith. And he hears about their love for other saints. And he didn't need anything else. He didn't need any more proof he didn't need to watch him for years. He says, I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I've heard about how you're serving with the saints. And he's going to go on to tell them how excited he is about them serving God. He says, how excited he is about them being saved. You'll see in his words a true love and joy for God saving souls, for God using people. A love that abounds, a love that pushes and propels him in his life. We're always excited about us, aren't we? We're always excited about when we have a victory, when we have success, when we have growth. And that's good. Be excited and thank God for those things. But life opens up and the body of Christ opens up and the church opens up to something a lot more magnificent when we are just as excited about other people getting saved, other people growing this year. The whole work of God opens up when we look beyond the end of our noses. We begin to then consider how are we impacting that brother or that sister. We begin to pray for them, that brother and sister. We begin to have joy and rejoicing when we see God working in their lives. Your whole life becomes much more colorful and wonderful when then you see this whole picture of what God's doing. They say, well, I thought God was calling me to be this, the one who's going to give a good sermon or a good Bible study, the one who's going to know how to you know, give some advice for parenting, or I was going to be the one who's going to be able to lead in the church work in this ministry and be able to do this or do that. Sometimes then we become disgruntled that it's not us. But if we look holistically as the body of Christ being one body, we begin to say, whoa, look, that arm is doing something big and the foot is doing something great. Remember our first sermon? 
the body of Christ. Oh, we have such joy when, when we look beyond ourselves and see what God's doing in the whole body of Christ. All he needs to do is hear. You know, I totally believe in fruit inspection, and when Paul shows up at Ephesus, he's probably going to look at some of their lives and be like, wait a second, you said you profess Christ, but in works you're, you're denying him. He might say that down the road, but right now, you know what he is? He's optimistic. He's optimistic that what they're saying is true. you saying you have faith in Christ? You're loving the saints? I believe it. I believe it. I want to give a little shout out this morning for optimism. Do you know that? Well, there is a place for being sober in this world. There is a place for being careful in this world. There is a place for lay hands on no man suddenly, right? Don't necessarily endorse somebody and everything they believe. There is cause for that in Scripture. But there is also cause in Scripture for hope and trust and belief in God being able to do all things, including save people, including use people. I want to give a shout out this morning for the idea of optimism. I believe pessimism. I don't believe pessimism is a biblical thing. I don't think it is. Again, I've described in terms, you know, being sober and serious, but I don't think pessimism is a scriptural thing. Someone who's always saying, no, that's not going to work out. No, oh, they're never going to change. No, oh, I'm never going to grow. God's never going to use us. This church is never going to do anything, right? That kid's not going to end up right. That decision's going to end up wrong. Pessimism, pessimism. I don't think it is a biblical trait. Pessimism, in my mind, is a fancy way of saying, I'm faithless. Pessimism is a fancy way of saying God can't do the impossible. Pessimism is a surefire way to demoralize Davids and a surefire way to grow more Goliaths. You can't fight that guy, David. Look at you. Not a chance. This guy's huge. He's strong. He's talented. Meanwhile, Goliaths grow larger and Davids shrink and cower. A pessimist on the sideline, not believing that God is on the throne, that God has power to rule and reign in your heart, in your heart, and their hearts. Pessimism is the best way to ruin a revival. Pessimism is the best way to eradicate joy, to decimate peace in your life. Pessimism. Well, I'm going to do this thing, and then all these terrible things are going to happen. Says who? Not God. God works things out. God makes wonderful things happen. God made it so that when all those children of Israel were, were going to cross the Jordan River, he made it dry land. He made it wonderful. It would have been a soggy, muddy mess of dangerous um, walking across that area of the river. He made it dry land. He did the same thing with the Red Sea. We don't need pessimistic people saying, Moses, Moses, we're going to go out in the middle of the Red Sea and the whole thing's going to be a muddy mess and we're going to get stuck. Or the whole thing's going to come caving down on us. Moses didn't need pessimists. He needed people to trust God, right? And trust that Moses was in touch with God. And we're going to go and we're going to march and it's going to hold up a wall to the left, a wall to the right of water. Impossible, physically impossible for water to stand up. Have you ever tried that with water? Every time I pour it out, it just falls down. You tried that, Kristen? But God had the water just stand up on the right and the left, and they walked through on dry ground. There wasn't a pessimist during that march. Well, there probably was, but by the time they finished it, they were like, well, we should trust God. Pessimism. Pessimism is misplaced as long as God is on the throne. When you see him taken off the throne, then you can be pessimistic. This whole thing might not work out. They got God, but they're not going to get God. He's on the throne permanently. Amen? Amen. Pessimism needs no place. It's even true in a falling nation. In an immoral nation. We can be pessimistic about government, doubtful, right? I get you that sense. But we still don't need to be pessimistic about God and what he's doing in this world. 
He's going to use his servants, his people for his honor and glory. Whoever wants to sign up is going to have a God-blessed life. I don't care if you're in the sewers of China or if you're in Lewiston in, in 2024. God's going to be with you. He's going to never leave you nor forsake you. So don't live your life, especially this election cycle, just pessimistic. Oh, that's the whole thing's over. No, it's not. It doesn't matter what happens in this world, God's still on the throne. As soon as Paul hears their faith, and as soon as he heard about them wanting to serve with the saints, that's all he needed to hear. Optimism. Optimism. Faith in God. Trust in God. It leads to this. Look at verse 16. Paul says, he, he, I cease not to give thanks for you. Cease not to give thanks for you. He's thankful. He's thankful that God has saved their souls and God's growing them. God's using them. He's thankful. Not only is he give, giving thanks for them, he's not stopping giving thanks he just keeps talking to God about it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for saving their souls. Thank you, God, for working in their lives. Thank you for putting them in my life. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, without ceasing. When's the last time you thanked God for somebody? How about that? I think it's okay. You're giving God the glory. I'm not talking about praising men and glorifying men and women, but I'm saying thanking God for who he's put in your life, who you've seen God work in their lives. God, I thank you for my spouse. I thank you for this brother, for this sister. I thank you for that preacher. Thank you for this teacher. When's the last time you thank God for somebody? The last time you looked at your father or mother or sister or brother or uncle or grandparent or anybody and said, thank you, God. We'll be very careful to thank God for a Wendy's hamburger, but not for a God-fearing wife. Lord, thank you for this sandwich. Lord, I've been praying for this sandwich for many years, Lord. You brought this sandwich into my life, and it has been everything I've ever needed, Lord. <laughs> we could be thankful for the people God brings our way, the mothers of our children, the fathers of our children, the brothers, sisters helping us learn this Bible, who's giving us a good godly example. The children who are blessing our souls by accepting Christ as their Savior and believing this book with childlike faith. We'll thank God for a pay raise, but not for people, right? Thank God for a salad, but not a sermon. We'll thank God for possessions, but not for people. Lord, thank you so much for this new vehicle you've given me, Lord. It's so important in my life. I don't know what I could ever do without it. We thank God for our successes, don't we? Lord, thank you for making me successful in this endeavor. But are we thankful for the servant that's serving next to us? God gives gifts to this earth, and one of the gifts that he gives are the saints together. We should be thankful for the body of Christ, the arm and the leg in your life, right? The ear and the nose in your life. These sermons are building on one another. If you, if you missed the first part, you're totally lost by now. Got to bring back out Mr. Potato Head and start at start. James chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 tells us this. It says, Do not err, my beloved brethren, every good gift... And every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. James tells us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from God. We thank him for it. You say, well, I don't have a perfect spouse. I don't have a perfect father, mother, sister, brother. 
uncle, aunt, grandparent. I don't have a perfect pastor, that's for sure. I don't have a perfect deacon, or I don't have a perfect teacher. Well, I want you to think about this a little bit. If those people have been bought by the blood of Christ, they are as perfect as they come. They're truly born again. They're as perfect as they come. They're washed from head to toe. They're white as snow. They're quite a gift in your life. If you have a saved person next to you, say amen. amen. You got someone that God, God the Son died for. You got someone that God the Father adopted sitting next to you. They're going to be in heaven one day sitting up there by Moses and Elijah and Abraham. Important enough to be there. Okay. Important enough to be in your life and valued in your life. Save people are a rare blessing. There aren't a lot of them around. They're not. I'll tell you that. People around the nations, they'll email me like, I need a good church. Well, okay, you're going to need one with saved people. That's the first point I want to tell you. You're going to need some people who are actually born again because there are a lot of people in churches aren't even born again. Okay, so let's look at fruits for salvation, right? Do they, do they have the gospel right or not, right? Do they believe sin is wrong still or not? Look at some of these things. There aren't a lot of saved people in this world, in this broad way that leads to destruction. There aren't a lot of saved people. So when you, you find them, I've said this for years, when you find them, hang on and be careful to let them go. We've had people in the past, you know, they profess Christ. Oh, great. Well, we're together in this world. And amen, brother. I'm not, I'm not walking away from you. Your God is my God, my people, your people. You lodge all lodge. Kind of that, right, Ruth and Naomi thing. Instead, but they have people today like Ruth who just walk away. They'll be, I'll find some other God, some other people, some other lodging place. There's a lot of good ones out there. No, there's only one God. <laughs> only some people believe in this real God, saved by the blood of Christ. Only some people. Yeah, saved people are a rare blessing. I want to say it this way. If we were excited about people being saved, think about this. If we were excited about people being saved, maybe they would be more excited about being saved. We talked about it in that sense, right? You're born again, brother. You got a lot to live for. God's growing you and changing you. He's working in your life. Praise God. If we talk with our brothers and sisters that way, they might feel that way more often. Now, I'm just the same old stupid person I've always been. I'm living for the world. That's all I expect of myself. That's all you expect of me. Maybe that's what God expects of me. No, it's not. It's called it a holy calling. God expects a lot out of you. He's given you a lot too. Let's remind each other that we're chosen, that we're called. How about this? If we were more excited about people being saved, maybe others would be more excited about getting saved. You think about that? If we told the world how excited we are that this new sister asked Christ to save her soul. My son asked Christ to save his soul. We started telling the world, the world's like, well, what's the big deal with that? Sometimes I think the world wonders, what's the big deal with you guys at church? You say you got this born again and eternal life, but you sure don't act too excited about it. You just barely get your butt back in church. No, I gotta go to church again. Well, just stop going, the world says. If you hate church and don't like going, why are you going? Then you gotta ask yourself, well, why don't I like going? We I, I firmly believe we defeat our own testimony in this world. I firmly believe we're not going to be able to lead people to the Lord because we aren't excited about the Lord. <laughs> we're not excited about the preaching. Right? Someone's going to open the scriptures. I've got to be there. My kids got to hear it. My friends got to hear it. My neighbors got to hear it. They got to hear it. I'm excited about the Word of God going out, right? But the world senses no excitement in the saint's mind about the things of God. Please look at Matthew chapter 13. We will come back to Ephesians, I promise. 
Matthew 13. Matthew 13 and verse 44. The truth is, God the Father gave everything. God the Son gave everything to purchase salvation. Look at verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he, hide, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Treasure in this field. Treasure in this field is speaking of the church, the common people accepting Christ as their Savior. Treasure there. Selleth all that he hath and goeth and buyeth it. Look at verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. The truth is, God gave everything to purchase the church with his blood, to purchase that pearl of great price. Believers. A huge price was paid to redeem souls. What a transaction. Everything, given everything to purchase, purchase salvation for those who will believe. Think about that. God giving everything to save souls. Save that person next to you. God sending his son to die on the cross, right, for their sins. That Savior marching toward Calvary to shed his blood and give everything on the cross of Calvary for their sins. Their blood bought. I'm, I'm preaching this morning to have us be thankful for the saved people we have in our lives. We've got some people wanting to join the church today. We should thank God they profess Christ as their Savior. Thank God they want to serve with the saints in a local church. It's a wonderful moment for rejoicing. Amen. The truth is, down here and look at verse 47. We'll see from 47 to 51. The truth is, most people are hell bound. Look at 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full... They drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angel shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. See, today it's all kind of just running together, isn't it? All the churches, all the faith, all the religion. There's this big old uh, net full of all kinds of stuff. At the end of the world, the angels are going to have some of this job, it says, of taking away the true believers from the ones who didn't believe. Fifteen shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus saith unto them, Have ye understood all these things? They say unto him, Yea, Lord. The truth is, most people are hell bound. Truth is, most people are faking their faith. Just playing a game with their profession of faith. Just going through the motions of this Christian life. They're not really born again. That's the truth. So we're to be thankful for those who are truly born again. We see God working in their lives. We have the pleasure of watching God use them in this world. It says the others will be cast into a furnace of fire. There should be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's the sad outcome of the per people who do not believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is hell fire in every story Christ tells. Not just in metaphors, but in real stories Christ tells. Luke 16, for one, be an example. Hell is where they go. The angels even have a job in saying this is a believer, this isn't a believer, it says here in this story. The angels have a part. I want you to think about the angels for a second because let's remind ourselves of what we learned in Luke. Look at Luke 15. Luke 15. Remember we preached this during our Luke series. I want to come back here again. It tells us a lot about the scene in heaven. The scene in heaven. 
Please read this with me here in 15 verse 3. Follow along, I mean. And ask yourself if you have any sentiment uh, comparable to theirs. Does your heart look like these angels and how they view the world? The angels and just the picture in heaven. Look first, let's first do the one in, in verse 3. Look at 15, 3. What man of you, Jesus says, having a hundred sheep, if you lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. We know what this parable is talking about. It's talking about how all we like sheep have gone astray. All mankind like sheep have wandered off. And God has this heart of wanting to find every last one of them. No Calvinist thought here, not 50%, not 20%. He wants to find 100%. That's who he's seeking for salvation. He's not willing that any should perish. So he's marching after this lost sheep. He finds the lost sheep. He's rejoicing with the lost sheep on his shoulders at the picture of God having saved a soul. A soul been reconciled to him. There's joy with God the Father when someone accepts Christ as their Savior. It says in 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. Right? It doesn't say over one sinner that is accepted by mankind. One sinner that mankind is going to love on. But joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. One sinner that changes his mind about who he is and what he needs to save him. One sinner that repents and trusts Christ for his salvation. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. See, most people in the net, most people in the world, most people in the church, 99%, I don't need no Savior. I'm just going to disciple my way into salvation like Crosspoint teaches, or I'm going to work my way into salvation like so many churches teach, or I'm going to baptize my way into salvation like uh, Christ church, or the Church of Christ teaches. They don't need to change their mind and plead for Christ to save them. But there's joy in heaven over one person that truly gets it. Truly gets it. We've got some people we're going to baptize today. And when you ask them, they describe that they truly get it. That they're not saving themselves. They've changed their mind if that was ever in their mind. They've changed their mind and they're trusting what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. Trusting Christ's blood. And if that's what they believe, heaven's rejoicing. So we should say amen today. Amen. Look at verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she called her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. I just want us to remind us, uh, remind us of these stories. Because the angels are going nuts when people get saved. The angels are having a party. The angels are excited when people get saved. In heaven they're having a party. Down on earth can saints even crack a smile that someone got born again. Amen. The angels are rejoicing. We better thank God we better thank God when he saves some soul. We better rejoice in this building when someone comes to the Savior. Are you not excited about it? I meet people not excited about it in varying levels, right? There's us. There's old tired Logan who's here on a Sunday, and we talk about the gospel all the time, so it, it, can, it can become some sort of just old hat kind of thought. It shouldn't. There's that level, right? But I'm here, and I'm, I, I believe it's important, okay? But I'm asking God to put a fire in my soul, so I'm excited that young Titus accepted Christ. I'm excited this sister accepted Christ. I'm asking God to make me more excited about it. 
Give me a better heart to see how important it is in your eyes that you save the soul, Lord. Give me a better heart to rejoice in my soul over that more than I would rejoice over a meal tomorrow or a pay raise next year. Who cares? A soul got saved for your glory. Help me, Lord, to love it. Rejoice. But there's varying levels. Now, I'm bad. I'm bad. I just told you I'm bad. But there's some people who don't even believe in church work anymore. Who cares about saving souls? That church is doing nothing. Yeah, we are. If that little boy trusts Christ as his Savior, we're doing something important here. We're sharing the faith. Kids are getting saved. Adults are coming to the Lord. It's important. Sometimes we have to make that argument with people in the world, don't we? Well, that church, uh, church is no good. Well, how many people you led to the Lord in your life? We've seen a lot of this little church by the glory of God, by the grace of God. Uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm just speaking the idea of the local church. Rejoice in that. What comes together here matters. Don't let the world tell you otherwise. Well, that church, they're, you know, they got, they got bad coffee, so that's a bad church. That church, you know, they always talk about this sin, and that's a bad church because it always talks about that kind of sin. Oh, shut up. I'm sorry. Realign your thinking with the Word of God. That church, the pastor, I don't know, he says, um, a lot, so I'm not going to go there. It's not a good church. What's important, what's more important than people getting saved? And I mean really saved. I mean 20 years from now, we don't see the people in the big pen. We see them in the church serving. That's fruit that they really got saved. You know, a lot of people, I mean, you, so I'm with you. We say, Logan, a lot of people, there are a lot of churches that are saving souls. Uh, wisdom is justified of its children. You look where they are in about 20 years, okay? Then we'll, then we'll analyze that thing. A lot of churches are there doing false professions of faith because they're not really teaching the young children or the adults about repentance, about changing their mind about their sin. That's why they're not getting saved. We should thank God that one sinner comes to repentance. Look at this story in verse 11. It says, And he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. He divided unto them his living. That's what you call an entitled person, isn't it? Give me everything I deserve. I want to live my life. I want to live out my dream. People do this all the time. And by the way, I'm not going to mock this guy too much because at the end, he gets born again. But I just want to tell you, this is what's in mankind's heart. I deserve a lot of stuff. Give me what I, what I get in this world. My family needs to give it to me. Church needs to give it to me. Community needs to give me what I deserve. Well, he got what he wanted, but he's going to find out it wasn't everything he needed. Look at verse 13. In verse uh, 13, And not many days... After the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. How long did his stuff last? Not very long, was it? <laughs> Not very long. He just wasted his whole life journeying out living life his way. People are doing that all the time. People you know are doing that. I'm going to live my life my way. I'm going to go on my journey, on my path. This is, this is my path for my life. Nobody judge me. Well, if it's a stupid path, I'm going to call it a stupid path. Sinful path is a stupid path. It's going to lead to destruction in your life. But you journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Looking for pleasure at the bottom of a bottle, right? Looking for pleasure among people and sin. Look at 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Famines are hard, but we should thank God for famines. Because in famines in life, people finally realize they're not cutting it. They need help. They need something more than this life has to offer. Something more than this life can solve. Thank God for famines. We love everyone, but sometimes, you know what people need? We said people need a whale when we talk about Jonah. Sometimes people need famines. They need just to run out. They need to run out of money and finally look to 
the scriptures. You need to run out of health and finally look to the scriptures. Run out of friends or run out of success or run out of something and finally look to the scriptures. In that sense, it's a loving thing God did when he sent this famine to this, this man here. Maybe a famine coming in this nation and pray for souls to look to the Savior. But famines come in individuals' lives and pray they look to the Savior. And he went and joined himself, verse 15, to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. This entitled man has been, what has he been? Humbled. Feeding swine now. There are many a, many a man that walk this earth that need humbled. They don't even want to look at God and obeying God and serving God and serving their family as a spiritual man should. There are so many men like that and the answer is not enlightenment or growth. The answer is humility. Yes. Humility. In humility, you either can say, I want it, Lord, give it to me. Lord, I want it. Lord, help me be humble. Lord, help me be humble. You can get it that way. You have not because you ask not. Or you can get it the hard way, which is God right here in a famine. I told a man that recently is that if he does anything in his life at all, he should pray and ask God for humility. It'll, it'll impact his whole life. Look at 16. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. This man was entitled. He thought he deserved all kinds of things in life. Now the pigs have better than he has. Look at 17. And when he came to himself, I want to ask you this morning, are you listening to me? Are you listening? Have you come to yourself? He came to himself. It means he realized what he was. Lost. In famine. Undone. Worthless. Of no worth to himself, to his father, to anybody. Have you had a time when you came to yourself? That's that moment of repentance. People who truly get saved are those people who come to themselves and say, I'm no good. Oh my goodness, I'm not any good. I've broken enough rules to go burn in hell for eternity, absolutely. I've broken tons of God's rules, purposefully, habitually, because I loved it. That's why I did it again and again and again. Have you come to yourself? I went my own way on purpose. Right? I lived in sin on purpose. I got drunk on purpose. Right? I was in this sin. I told those lies on purpose. I was covetous my whole life on purpose. Come to yourself. Come to yourself. It's like that thief on the cross. He, he, he tells Christ, oh, I did all these things. I'm here justly hanging here because I lived this whole life on purpose. The thief my whole life on purpose. No one forced me to do it. It was my wicked, covetous nature did it. Come to yourself. Get honest with yourself. These are people who really get saved or people who finally get honest about themselves. He says, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. There's all these servants who are eating well, right? That's a neat little picture there of God's servants, Christians, eating well, living well spiritually, and you are starving your soul. You've got no spiritual food in your soul. You're hungry, you're famished. All the servants of my father, they're eating really good. Boy, saints, we are eating good. If you've got the Bible, Amen. you're walking with God, you're eating good. The world is famished. I perish with hunger. Look at 18. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say unto him, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. You see how he's going to go to his father? It's repentance toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ. He's going to go to his father and he's going to tell him a thing or two, isn't he? Well, this whole life didn't really work out. You gave me a rough life to live. No, he's done with that, isn't he? 
He's done with that. People don't come to the Savior who, who, who have that kind of outlook toward God, of them getting shortchanged. I know one man right now in my head in particular who I believe this is still holding him back. He's still not going to get saved until he drops the idea that he was shortchanged, right? He's got to drop that idea and say, no, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. That's where he's at. It's got to be right there, right? No one else's fault. Well, I was born into a bad family. That's why this whole life's been a mess, right? If you ever talk to homeless people, and we do, because we witness to them, we try to um, you know, feed them as appropriate and care for them, care for the poor. It's scriptural. If you ever talk to them, though, to a person, it's usually never their fault, ever, how their life unraveled. Hardly ever. It's never their fault. Yeah, well, my dad did this to me, and then and my work, you know, messed me all up, and then this doctor did this thing, or whatever. My wife, she was a mess. It's always somebody else's fault, right? No one gets saved until they realize it's their fault. No, this guy never comes back to the father. If anybody came back saying, hey, Dad, you kind of, you, you messed up raising me, Dad. It was your deal. It never comes back. It was the brother's fault. The other brother, he's, you know, you treat him so special, you never treated me nice. He never comes back. Coming to God is realizing you're the sinner. You're the one at fault. It says in 19, And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You know what that's saying in, in typology and form today, in application? That's like saying, I am not worthy to go to heaven, God. There ain't no way. I realize it. There ain't no way I'm worthy to go to heaven. So here he says, just make me one of your hired servants. You know, it's kind of cool, the idea now. We say, God, I know I can't. I'm not worthy of heaven, but please save my soul. And the wonderful thing is God saves our soul if we ask him. And then he washes our sins away. He makes us a servant and he makes us a son. We get more than we deserve, don't we? Look at verse 20. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, the fa his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Do you think God wants people saved? It's a picture of God, the Father. Yeah, he wants people saved. He is so eager watching souls right now in this room, watching their souls. He wants you to be saved. He's running toward the door of your heart. He's ready. He just needs you in faith to take a step toward him. Say, I believe, I believe, I believe. I repent. I change my mind about who I am, and I believe in Christ. He says in verse 21, And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. There's humility. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. When you get saved, you are arrayed in glorious apparel, white as snow by the blood of the Lamb. We're sons now, God the Father. Look at verse 23. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. This story, this um, parable is wonderful, and it's meant to bring out some insights about people repenting and coming to the Father God for salvation, right? And so these things, you can take, you wouldn't take them like over literally, you don't want to over literalize it, but you see some picture here of the father and his household being happy, right? Not only has the change happened in the son, he, he's been forgiven and he's been arrayed in, in beautiful apparel, but you see this rejoicing in, in the house. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. God says, let's be happy. Someone came back. Someone got saved. Let's be happy. He was lost, uh, he, is, excuse me, he was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry at the call of the Father. Isn't it wonderful when people get saved? We're seeing here at Truth Baptist Church, we're seeing the dead made alive again. 
Let's get out the fatted calf. Amen. We're seeing people who went astray return, repent, and come to the Father. Let's get out the fatted calf. We're seeing God save people who were wasting their lives. Anybody ever done that before? Some of you relate. You were wasting your life, right? Until you got saved, you were wasting your life, right? I mean, for God's glory, you might have done some decent things as a worker or as a parent, but for God's glory, you were wasting your existence. Get out the fatted calf. We're seeing God save people who were in the pig pen, and now they're not. Get out the fatted calf. We're seeing people. We're seeing the lost found. We're seeing the sick healed, the sinners saved. Get out the fatted calf. Rejoice in your heart about what God is still doing today in this world. He has not stopped saving souls. He has not stopped calling people to serve him. Look at verse 25. Now his elder son was in the field, and he came and drew nigh to the house. He heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. What's going on in there? This is one of those pessimists. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he hath received him safe and sound. And he was angry. Angry. There is no use in this family. There's no use in this church. There's no use in heaven for people who aren't excited about people repenting. There's no use for them. They're drains, right? They're Johnny Rain clouds when we should praise God. There's no place for them. The demoralizers, the pessimists. This elder son has got to figure it out what really matters. He's mad. He'll talk about how come you never did the cow for me? How come I never got the fatted calf? His whole life is still thinking about him, isn't it? My growth. <laughs> That's the fatted calf. My successes. What happens in my life? Those are the things we need to throw a party about. No one's doing that for me. This elder son is a picture, I'm sorry, it can't be a picture, of Christians today still focused on their glory. When what should we be happy about? A soul just repented and turned to the Father. Are you as happy as you should be about people getting saved? Are you? Are you as happy as you should be about the gospel going out? Sometimes uh, culture, it's, it's leavened by, you know, some specific people. It can be. And you get, that's why the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians, talks about one, leaven can leaven the whole lump. And sometimes leaven is not about a lie. Like sometimes in churches they'll have someone start spreading a lie or some doctrinal error. And that's problematic, terrible. But it also can be what spreads is just a, a unthankful heart, an unjoyful heart. It can spread. Pretty soon, oh, that guy's not excited about someone getting saved or what the church is preaching and kids getting saved and Sunday school being taught and sermons going out and witnessing, you know, tracts being handed out throughout the valley. They're not excited about it. I'm not going to be excited about it. No big deal. Pretty soon you, you get a whole culture of people saying, why is the Father so excited about people getting saved? Why is the Father so excited about the gospel going out? Culture. Our, our culture should be one of soberly and seriously serving our Savior. There's a lot of S's there, right? But our culture should also be one of rejoicing, rejoicing that God saves souls, rejoicing that God is growing people. Maybe your heart is there with me that we need God to make us excited about that. And if he does, it'll change the way we get busy for the Lord. It will. It'll just happen. You ever, you ever done something you're excited to do and something you're not excited to do? Like, I'll be honest, I'll, my, my work will have to hear this and rebuke me one day, but I get, sometimes I get projects at my work that I am just not excited to do. 
It's like one of those long, boring projects, you know. And I'll do it the best of my ability, but sometimes it takes a little longer, not on purpose, but it just does. But if you give me a project I'm excited about, boom, I'm on it. I can, I, and sometimes people are surprised. Whoa, you did that in two hours? Yeah, because I loved it. That was a good one. That was fun. That was exciting. Well, brothers, what would happen in this church if we got real excited about the soul-saving business again? Soul-saving ministry, the kids, these little kids hearing the gospel. What if we got more excited? What kind of work could God have us do? What would it do for you to get excited? Boy, I tell you what, probably wouldn't miss much church anymore. Probably wouldn't fall asleep at sermons. We probably wouldn't probably have our Bibles open, ready to roll, ready to rock, ready to share. Excited about a brother or sister who's doing those things. Loving a spouse who wants those things. Let's go back to our text here in Ephesians. I ended up making a longer sermon out of this. That's my specialty. I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at Ephesians. I'm, I'm just, we're not turning anywhere else. It's in Ephesians chapter 1. I want to do the second sentence. It's, it's, it's just what comes next, I believe. When you are thankful, when you are thanking God, you're praying. Look at verse 16. I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul is praying for these people. He's so thankful for them, what God's done, and now he's praying for them. I want to, as we finish this sermon, we finish this text, I want to put in this thought of praying for people. You're not done praying for somebody even once they get saved, right? I love it. Pray for the lost, pray for the lost, pray for the lost. But brother, pray for the saved, pray for the saved, pray for the saved. You'll find these lines that Paul says throughout the epistles. I give thanks for you and I make mention of you in my prayers. Repeats it, repeats it, repeats it. Pray hard for people to get saved. Pray hard for people who are saved. What should we pray about? Look at verse 17. That the God of our Father, excuse me, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. I'm going to pray this for all of you, but today I especially want to pray for our two folks getting baptized. Let's pray that God would give them and us wisdom. Wisdom to serve God, wisdom to love God, wisdom to obey God, to share God. Let's pray for others to have wisdom. We can. Don't be worried about them getting wiser than you. If they're wiser than you, that will be good for your life. Right? Don't pray. Don't worry about your spouse getting wiser than you. You want a wise spouse. You don't, you don't want an unwise spouse. Pray for them to become the most wise resource you have right next to you. And your pastor, your church, pray that they grow in wisdom. Look at 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Pray, pray for your brothers and sisters to know the hope of his calling. With this hope, you will never lose hope. I pray for our baptism candidates today that they know the hope of God's calling because they will live this life never losing hope because it's always there while you still have breath, you still have a job to do. To the very end of your days, you've been called for God's purpose and that purpose means hope. Pray for people to know the hope of their calling. Look at eight, or 18, it also says, and, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Pray that your brothers and sisters would know the riches of the glory with the saints. It says, in, in the saints. That to me speaks of the joy of serving alongside other brothers and sisters. Pray that your brothers and sisters would never lose that joy would always realize that that's how God put the church together, was to serve with other saints. That's where he gets the glory. That's where the redounding of his thanksgiving just abounds more and more. Look at 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Pray that your brother and sister would know the greatness of God's power. 
the greatness of God's power, that they would never doubt again, that they would firmly grasp. It's your brother or sister, right? This is your spouse. This is your pastor. This is your, and the Lord, someone of the Lord, you know, this is your children. They would know the power of Almighty God, capable of bringing down strongholds, capable of holding up the walls of water, toppling Jericho. Pray that they would know the greatness of God's power and that they would never doubt again. If God's in it, you can do it. If God wants it done, it'll get done. And will you be a part of it or not? With God, all things are possible. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Look at verse 20. What kind of power are we talking about? We can trust in God, friends. You've been saved. He's your Father. He's adopted you. His Holy Spirit flows through you. What kind of power are we talking about? Look at verse 20. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that's brought you to a new life in Christ. That's enough power to be a new creature. That's enough power for old things to pass away and all things to become new. That's enough power to overcome sin in your life. That's enough power to serve him in your life, right? Look at verse 21. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world which is to come. The same power that put Christ on the throne has put the power of the Holy Spirit in your heart. God is that powerful. Christ raises from the dead. He's up on the throne. He sends down the Holy Spirit into your heart. That kind of power. The Holy Spirit that will guide and comfort you all your days. To grieve not the Spirit. Look at verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is, the, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The same power that put Christ as the head of the church is the same power that puts you in the body of Christ, the church. Same power. This is talking about God's power here as it relates to being able to take care of you to use you in your life. I pray our two baptism candidates will know all of these things, will realize all of these things, will have all these things in their life as they serve them. And I pray that they would fulfill their calling in this world. And I pray that every one of us would do the same. And maybe for some of us who were baptized long, long ago, Maybe we've lost some sense of the joy that we should have about that. Lost some sense about the joy we should have about others who come to the Savior. Maybe we've lost some sense about what are we doing in this life? What's important? Well, God is out on those hills trying to bring back the one lost sheep. Right? That's what God's focused on. What are we focused on? Ourselves? May it not be said at Truth Baptist Church. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd bless this sermon. Lord, now as we, Lord, we'll have an altar call, Lord, I pray that you bless that. But then, Lord, I pray that you bless our, our baptismal service, that it would bring glory to you. I pray that you bless these two uh, candidates here, Lord, for baptism. You bless them in their lives. I thank you for their profession of faith. I pray that you be with them, Lord, over all their years. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.